Okay, welcome back everyone to uh, Phonetics 2. I'm recording this session back to back with the other sessions. So any un events that have been unfolding uh, over the last week, I don't know of, but I do hope that our way of communication um, is suitable and workable for most of you. Um, but as a reminder, if you have suggestions um, or issues, please let me know. Uh, yeah, I'm quite happy to um, amend the plan um, and incorporate any suggestions that you may have. Okay, so we'll talk about phonetics too today. We'll talk about the vowels. Last week we talked about the consonants. So today we'll uh, tackle uh, the vowels of English. So the objectives for this session will be that you're uh, able to describe the vowel space, apply the terminology that we use to describe vowels, um, that you can describe the English vowel system yourself, and that you can identify and distinguish between different types and classes of vowels. You should also be able to know and identify the difference between vowel and consonant description, why we take different approaches. After this session, you should be able to master basic transcription and be able to read and translate text in uh, phonetic transcription. Towards the end of the session, we will also talk a, a little bit about why this knowledge is useful and uh, where you will um, apply all this phonetic knowledge in your future classes or outside of university. Okay, so um, let's start with uh, one of my favorite videos that illustrates what happens when we speak. And I'm going to play it to you twice. So first time around, pure enjoyment. Um, and the second time, I'll point out a couple of things to look at in particular. When it comes to singing, I love to sing French art songs. It's probably my favorite type of song to sing. Um, I'm a big fan of Debussy. Um, I mean, I also love operas. I, I love singing Donizetti and Mozart and Strauss. Uh, but when I listen to music, I tend to listen to uh, hard rock or classic rock music. And one of my favorite bands is ACDC. Um, and my favorite song is probably Back in Black, which I'll listen to over and over again. And Okay, first thing you notice um, that you were, pr were probably not aware of is that we have a lot of tongue, right? So when you look at it from this perspective, uh, it's almost as if we have this little alien inside our heads who wants to um, escape. Um, but what you can clearly see, and that's what you can uh, pay more attention to in uh, the next round, is um, where the tongue touches um, the secondary articulators at the front, teeth, alveolar ridge, um, how the velum is raised and lowered and continuously during speech, um, so for the air to either escape through the oral cavity or through the nasal cavity. Um, and what you should pay particular attention to, because that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about vowels, is um, that the tongue actually changes shape and changes position um, a lot. When it comes to singing, I love to sing French art songs. It's probably my favorite type of song to sing. Um, I'm a big fan of Debussy. Um, I mean, I also love operas. I, I love singing Donizetti and Mozart and Strauss. Uh, but when I listen to music, I tend to listen to uh, hard rock or classic rock music. And one of my favorite bands is ACDC. Um, and my favorite song is probably Back in Black, which I'll listen to over and over again. And all right. Um, so you have noticed that it's not just the tip of our tongue. Um, it's also the shape of the tongue. You know, sometimes it's shaped like this and sometimes it's uh, slightly shaped like this. And the tongue moves towards the back um, uh, in, in, in total and the tip would sort of move further um, to, the f to the front. So uh, we will actually make use of these properties in describing the vowels. Because one of the things that obviously we don't have at our disposal um, now is where articulators touch. Okay, so that was one of our major uh, distinctions between um, uh, vowels and consonants. Which brings us 
uh, right into the IPA chart um, where last week we did talk about um, the dimensions that we have uh, to describe the consonants, namely the place of articulation and manner of articulation. That obviously doesn't work for the vowels that have no obstruction of airflow, so there is no um, contact or close contact between um, the articulators. So if we don't really have place and we don't really have manner, um, we need to look at what the tongue does um, in the production of these sounds. So um, if you say the, f mm, the following words, you should be able to feel your tongue um, move um, uh, on a um, horizontal axis, right? So with near, net, knock, especially with near, net, knock, Right, so near knock, uh, you can clearly feel um, the tongue moving um, from the front to the back and uh, vice versa. And with the words clock, cut and cat, uh, you probably feel the tongue moving slightly in um, a vertical direction. So with clock, it's sort of further up and with cat, you sort of move further down and further to the front um, as well. So essentially what, we, what we're measuring um, in vowel um, production or vowel description is the position or the highest position, sort of the rough highest position of the tongue um, in what we call the vowel space, right? Um, which we distinguish on a couple of dimensions, so the front back dimension and um, top and bottom dimension. So, which brings us back to um, sort of a rough classification of vowels, right? If you ask anyone um, uh, of your friends or your family what are the vowels, they would probably come up with something like A, E, I, U, U. Um, that's a very coarse grained classification, obviously, because we have many more vowels than that. But uh, we do have A, E, I, U, U vowel areas, so to speak, right? So the E vowels are. Um, produced usually with the tongue high and to the front and the U vowels are to the back and sort of A vowels tend to be um, centered but at the bottom. So this video clip I'm going to show you illustrates how the tongue moves between these different cardinal um, areas. Okay, play it to you once more, but you should clearly be able to see um, that the tongue has a highest position in different um, of, of these areas. Right, okay. Um, the video didn't have any, any sound, so uh, there's nothing happening with the equipment. Okay, so uh, we can describe different uh, vowels along these uh, dimensions of the tongue. Now, before we do that, um, a quick um, note of, of illustration. We are describing the vowels of RP English, which um, you're well aware is um, received pronunciation. Um, these days, um, also be called uh, BBC English, is sort of the most uh, socially and geographical neutral uh, variety of English. Uh, in the British Isles. And um, another major system that you may come across in textbooks is uh, General American, same thing, um, socially neutral, uh, geographically neutral uh, variety of um, American English. Um, we do that, is w w the why we do that is essentially arbitrary, right? Um, we could be describing the vowel system of um, Scottish English, we could be describing the vowel system of Australian English or Nigerian English. Um, that choice is essentially arbitrary. So uh, there is a tendency, unfortunately, to uh, pay a lot of attention uh, to uh, receive pronunciation, uh, but for our purposes, to illustrate the basic idea of vowel description, uh, that choice is um, not as important. Okay, so uh, you, can you, you apply the same terminology to the description of um, vowel systems of other varieties. But yeah, we are describing a vowel system of a variety that is spoken by um, only a few people and, um, and spoken natively only by um, a few people. 
Okay. <clears throat> right, so we start with the monophthongs, right? It's uh, uh, vowels that are uh, simple vowels, and we come to the diphthongs that are more complex um, in a second. So here's our vowel chart. Uh, generally, for English, it is enough to have a 3x3 three three grid uh, to describe the vowels exhaustively. Um, other languages, such as German, would have a 4x3 uh, uh, dimension, and then there are languages um, whose vowel system is relatively uh, simple, where sometimes you would only need um, a 3x2 uh, grade or even, uh, even less. Okay, what's the point of that? Well, we can um, split up this vowel space into coordinates, right? So high, mid, low, uh, front, central, back, and then each of these um, tiles is, uh, you can reference, right? So um, vowels that are produced with the tongue um, at the front and the high uh, would be high front vowels and so on and so forth. So for English, we would have um, uh, a, a class of, of short vowels uh, right, they're also called lax vowels. It's sit, set, some, sad, sod, foot. It's a very short um, vowel and a class of long vowels. Seed, bird, bath, bought, and food. Uh, okay, so uh, you notice the difference that um, their the vowel duration is um, longer uh, than with the short vowels. Um, this is often indicated or in most transcription systems, um, which makes it a lot easier for us to distinguish them, um, indicated by this length mark, which kind of looks like a semicolon. Now you can pause the video now because normally I would um, do an exercise with you where you can take these words and sort of locate them, try and place them on uh, the vowel chart. So pause the video, uh, do that, and we'll discuss that in a second. Okay, um, so we sh start with the short vowels, the i vowel, sit, i, i, okay, high front. Not working. Ah, there we go. High front vowel, set, e, i, e, i, sit, set, i, e, right, tongue's moving a bit down but still at the front. Some, even further down but Set more central, sad, right? Some, sad, some, sad. You may have to overdo it to actually feel it. It, it, it is very difficult um, to, to see, to feel the difference. Um, sod, right? If you overdo it, it's quite clear. It's very uh, low and very back. And then foot, um, obviously, is further up uh, the, the top. In contrast, the the um, long vowels seed. Again, we have a high front vowel, and this time we have an even even higher and more to the front uh, position of the tongue. Right? If you sit, seed, sit, seed, e, 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 right? You can sort of feel the tongue moving uh, backwards. Bird, quite relaxed. Right? So here we have a central vowel, bath, at least in RP English, be very low and very back. Bought, bar, bath, bought, bath, okay, slightly further to the top. And then food, uval, um, high back. And here you have the, the same, uh, or the sort of a mirror um, situation as with the E sounds, with the U sounds, right? Is that the longer uh, a vowel tends to be um, more extreme, further to the top and further to the back or front. And then there is one sound, the so-called schwa. And I don't have an example um, here because it is a bit of a special sound and it's one of these sounds that is not systematically represented by any letter, right? So if you think back to this the discussion we had on orthography versus pronunciation, um, all the other um, sounds, they sort of have, they tend to have like a dominant orthographic representation, even though it's not um, straightforward, but the schwa is not represented by a any letter whatsoever. So it can represent any of the spellings that you would have for all the other um, vowels. 
the schwa and we come back to the schwa in a second is um, a mid central vowel it's sort of when when your tongue is in the most neutral relaxed uh, position so similar to uh, the bird vowel One remark on the symbol notation. Now the length mark um, is used and it makes it easier for us to recognize long vowels, but technically we wouldn't require it, at least in this uh, transcri transcription system, because the difference between all the short vowels and the long vowels is already clear by different symbols that we're using, even though they may actually be in the same, um, produced in the same area. Uh, so, yeah, the length mark could be dropped, but it does make it easier for you to recognize what's a long and what's a short vowel. So, uh, using different i uh, symbols there um, is not a coincidence, that's a uh, convention. Um, that illustrates or reflects the qualitative difference between uh, a different sounds. So, what we just said with the i and i sound and the u and u sound, they're not only different in quality, in length, uh, they're also, uh, sorry, in quantity, i.e. length, they're also different in quality in that the tongue is, on average, in a different position. Um, uh, yep. So that is reflected in the system. You may actually come across other transcription um, systems that do not use the length marker, but we'll stick with um, the easier one. So the classification of vowels comes in um, along three actually four dimensions, length, height, position, and the state of the lips. So a length is, uh, is it a short or a long vowel, height of the tongue is high, mid, and low. Um, in English, we need only the three dimensions on that um, axis. Sometimes it's also, uh, you find um, descriptions where they use a closed, mid-closed, mid-open, and open classification um, that refers to the fact that you close the airstream and you open the airstream or you close your mouth and you open your mouth that kind of thing so same um, uh, principle with the closed mid closed mid open uh, distinction you can actually have four rows in your vowel space so some languages uh, need that including uh, a German position of the tongue front central back and the state of the lips I, are, the, are your lips rounded or unrounded. Now why is that in brackets? Because roundedness in English only affects three vowels um, and then and it's not a distinctive feature um, of these vowels. What do I mean by that? Well if we look at the vowel space and the three um, rounded vowels, right? Ooh, 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 and o, oh, the lips, does not distinguish uh, between uh, uh, vowels. So um, if you look at, at these two vowels, they're already distinguished because um, they're in different uh, uh, tiles, right? So the difference between U and O can be described simply by the height of the tongue. Um, the difference between U and I is distinguished by um, the position of the tongue, front-back orientation. Um, so more to the point, the distinction between these two sounds is already indicated by length. Right, so you don't need to um, say that one is rounded and the other one isn't. Well, in this case, actually both rounded. Um, but here you don't need the feature roundedness doesn't distinguish uh, between the vowels. I'll come back to that um, at the end because that's not always the case. So German, for instance, roundedness does distinguish between uh, sounds. So we need, uh, we need that. Okay, um, quick break. Or uh, coming back to the schwa, right? Um, the schwa you find in English unstressed syllables, a long harmony. It's not a long, not harmony. Well, unless you uh, um, uh, put particular emphasis on it, in which case it's um, a stressed syllable. But uh, yeah, in general, like all unstressed syllables would have the schwa vowel, which makes it a bit difficult at the beginning in transcribing um, because you have to um, watch out for uh, stress and non-stressed uh, syllables. But because this is so um, relevant for, for English as it is in German, um, the schwa is actually the most frequent 
sound. Now that's kind of bizarre because it's not represented by any um, any letter at all. Uh, a schwa can represent any of the other um, many vowels that we just uh, uh, looked at. So we also find it in, in German, like in Mücke or, the, or Gesprungen. And uh, yep, for the time being, um, keep in mind the schwa is never stressed. Okay, so um, we've talked about the monophthongs. Now we have the diphthongs. Um, monophthongs are simple vowel, right? One vowel, diphthong. They appear to contain two vowels. So if you look at uh, these examples, uh, lane, light, loin, low, loud, beer, cure, bear. So you see that the tongue moves position um, as you pronounce uh, these words. Now, one obvious question would, would be, why do we consider them one sound instead of a combination of two? Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. We'll come back to them uh, next week. Um, one reason is, is that they're um, they're not random, right? So it's it's um, out of all the monophthongs, there's only a few that would actually uh, combine to make diphthongs, and there's only uh, three groups, at least in English, um, of diphthongs. So it's the diphthongs that end in i, i. That's the first group. The diphthongs that end in u. Second group and diphthongs that end in a schwa. Uh, third group, right? So not every vowel combines with um, every other vowel. So, so bet, um, keep that in mind. Right, so diphthongs are classified as follows. You have um, a start position, so that's their first vowel. So lane starts in an eh position, light starts in an ah position, loin in an o oh position. And then they move towards um, their end position. So that's sort of indicated by the, the, the change of the tongue. Right, so for uh, lane, light and loin, this would look um, as follows. During production, your tongue moves to um, uh, the high front position. For low and loud, it moves to um, a high back position. And for a beer, bear and cure, it moves to a mid-central position, into the schwa uh, position. So therefore, we will can classify the diphthongs by whether they're closing, right? The tongue is closing the airstream or the mouth is closing, or whether the tongue moves into a center uh, position so that we have um, two rough classes um, of uh, diphthongs. Right, so similar to what we looked at last week, um, there's also a bunch of links that you can um, try this out. And I'm using, which one will I be using? Uh, this one, perhaps. Okay, so um, that's the, the general IPA uh, table for the vowels with your cardinal vowels um, at the center and then some other vowels um, in between. Some of these symbols are different um, because that system was devised to describe languages in general and the system we're using um, has sort of conventionalized in the description of English. So they may be different, but the principle uh, remains the same. Okay, so you can click on these. Um, e, 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 e. Notice that the difference between these two is roundedness. So here's the unrounded version, and that's the rounded version. We'll come back to that um, as well. So you can play around with this, and also all the other links would have um, uh, uh, sample ideas and uh, show you the, the position of the tongue, um, especially in that last Iowa link uh, there. Now, I, um, I told you to come back to this distinctiveness and to the roundedness. So um, what we just heard, the E and the U uh, are different uh, up here. Uh, so remember that in English, roundedness we don't really need uh, because it, it doesn't distinguish between sounds. But I said that in German it does. So if you have a German vowel space, uh, which generally has a, th a four by three um, vowel grid, uh, roundedness is distinctive, right? So the difference between kiste and küste, i, u, i, u, is one of roundedness. 
So here's your first um, dinner trick. So next time, once this whole thing uh, uh, blows over, next time you go to your dinner party, you meet an American um, or an English or um, a Nigerian who um, has trouble pronouncing the U in, in German, simply get them to say E and then round their lips, right? So E, U, E, U. There you go. So um, this is how um, some of this knowledge will actually help you um, help others, uh, help you understand what's uh, what's going on. Okay, so English roundedness, not distinctive. You can use it to describe the vowels, but it's not necessary. It doesn't add more information, whereas in, in German um, it does. Okay, so uh, to wrap up this session, apart from uh, dinner party tricks and helping uh, learners, why all this trouble? Well, most of what we um, perceive as accent is actually a difference in vowel quality. Now, we we're describing the vowel system of RP English, um, but the vowel system of any variety, uh, be it um, geographical or social, is where people pronounce the vowels very differently. Right, so the consonants don't vary that much between uh, varieties, it's the vowels that um, are particularly important and where you can actually perceive the difference and tell where people come from based on um, the pronunciation of uh, certain words because they would have different um, vowels in their uh, native variety. I'm going to illustrate that with a particularly bad example. Um, it does work, but don't take it at face value. It is kind of um, funny though. Uh, if you have the following pronunciation, you're going to die, right? So for an Australian, this could be something very straightforward, very simple, very um, naive. Whereas for an English, this might actually sound like something uh, pretty bad. So you're going to die. Um, that is where misunderstandings can happen. Normally they don't, but um, that is an area where you have different um, vowel systems um, that clash, perhaps. Okay, um, furthermore, study of vowels then is important in, um, yep, in English varieties and sociolinguistics, so it can be a regional variety, but can also be class variety, um, class or, um, yep, social variety. Um, you can also need, or can also apply that to, uh, in learner pedagogy, now that doesn't um, only apply to vowels, but also to consonants, right? So think about um, how you could um, advise people um, or learners of English um, to produce the TH uh, sound, right? It's particularly um, relevant for all European or speakers of other European languages who cannot produce um, uh, the dental fricative. And you will revisit um, vowel change and vowel knowledge in uh, the history of English. So um, there was a very weird change, um, weird but systematic, um, and that change explains a lot why we, why the English orthography appears to be so messy. Well, it is messy, it doesn't just appear like that, but um, there was a, a change in vowels, right? So in the old days, um, Old English, Early Middle English, Middle English, uh, you would say Z, right, a cognate to uh, German Zien, whereas today you say C, Z, C, right? So there was a, a raise in the vowel, uh, similar to time, right, that w uh, was pronounced team in, uh, in the old days. That is now time, so there was um, a raise for C, Z, C, and for time it was team, time. Right, so there's a uh, difference. So this change um, is generally referred to as the Great Vowel Shift. So what happened in um, late Middle English is that all the long vowels of Middle English uh, were raised. So if it was a, um, a low vowel, it was raised to the top. So Z, C, right? Um, and if a vowel was already at the top, that became diphthong, guys, because you couldn't raise it any higher, obviously, if you're already at the top. Um, so Team became time um, uh, diphthongized uh, vowel. Now that change was so systematic across the entire vowel uh, space is that, that it kind of reshuffled the entire um, vowel system, vowel inventory of, of English. Okay, sorry, I just had to um, uh, get the phone. But um, 
yeah, to come back to um, an explanation for the great um, mismatch between orthography and uh, pronunciation in English, which is especially um, obvious in, in the vowels, is that um, in the Middle Ages, Middle English, uh, spelling was very variant depending on where people came from um, and there was lots of variation so they would write uh, the way they speak. Then came book printing. So book printing was invented um, and people started to agree um, explicitly or implicitly on how to spell words. Um, so that kind of created a convention um, that was fixed that reflected the uh, pronunciation in Middle English. Then the great vowel shift happened. Vowels were raised, diphthongized, and it was th the whole vowel system of English was in a flux. So it was a um, process that lasted um, roughly 200 years and didn't affect all of um, the British Isles. But um, yeah, by the end of the great vowel shift and the reshuffling of the English vowel system, orthography had been conventionalized so much that people said, no, we're not going to change that, we'll leave it um, as is. So if you um, take the Middle English classes and, and Old English classes for that matter, is, um, is that the, the way that Middle English is spelled is um, often a very good predictor of um, how things were pronounced uh, there. So, okay, two dinner tricks um, already from one uh, tiny linguistics video. Uh, should leave it here. Okay, so um, to sum up, you should be able to describe now the vowels and the consonants of English and why we take different approaches and describing them. You should master the uh, description of um, or classification of vowels in terms of duration, height and position of the tongue and you should also know why roundedness um, is uh, not as relevant for English as it would be for other uh, languages. Within the vowels we can distinguish um, several types, uh, long, short, uh, monophthongs, diphthongs and you should also have a basic understanding of, of what you can um, do with this knowledge um, in your future classes or beyond a university. Okay, so um, next week uh, we'll probably talk about phonemes, allophones and what that has to do with um, phonetics because one obvious question is how do we know that these are the sounds of English and not some other sound that English necessarily have, right? So um, think about the glottal stop in the butter, butter um, distinction, right? Why is that not a sound of English? Why is that not a phoneme? What is a phoneme? So we will talk about these issues um, next week, which are still um, slightly technical, but um, they kind of wrap up the phonetic session um, as well and should also give you some time to do additional transcriptions. So with that, um, again, stay safe, stay sane and stay home. Bye.